Uh, good afternoon. And uh, hope we had a good break. I know I stand between us and closing. So hopefully we will have a very nice discussion this afternoon about water and resiliency efforts and governance efforts around water resiliency. My name is Pilar Thomas. I'm the Deputy Director at the Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs at the Department of Energy. And I have to be honest, I feel like a little bit of a fish out of water here. But I thank James for asking me to moderate and participate. It's uh, probably a little cognitive dissonance to have someone working with tribes around tribal energy development. Um, one, participating in the panel, but two, moderating. So I, I thank uh, James for inviting me, and I look forward to uh, this afternoon's discussion. Uh, I'm from uh, Arizona. I'm a member of the Pascua Yaqui tribe, which is outside of Tucson uh, in southern Arizona. And uh, we're going to hear today from uh, three folks uh, who are dealing with water resiliency issues, uh, mostly in the urban water environment. Uh, and, and water uh, operations, uh, wa wastewater system uh, treatment, and then of course uh, uh, ensuring and, and uh, compensating for some of the challenges that we have with climate change and resiliency in, in wastewater and safe drinking water systems. Um, I'm gonna, first what we're going to do is just introduce the whole panel, uh, and then we'll have each of the panelists speak for about 10 to 12 minutes. Um, in their respective areas, and I'm going to go last and talk a little bit about some additional considerations that we uh, like to encourage, especially state and local governments, to think about when it comes to water planning, water resiliency, and that's tribes uh, and tribal water rights and tribal water issues, especially out west, um, and some of the implications for uh, those uh, rights to water uh, in people's water planning exercise. The first uh, speaker today is going to be Jonathan Reeves. Jonathan uh, administers the DC, uh, that's the part, uh, District of Columbia, uh, Water and Sewer Authority, the Authority's Emergency Management Program. The program is designed to follow four tenets, mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. He directs emergency response and planning activities, as well as the Authority's involvement in the National Capital Region Critical Infrastructure Protection Program. Wow, do you guys have an acronym for that one? <laughs> I thought we had long titles at the Department of Energy. He developed and oversees a comprehensive national incident management system for the authority, and inclu including the emergency management accreditation program. He maintains relationships with industry, government, and public service organizations to enhance the authority's image and help meet its object objects. Previously, he was a project manager and senior analyst and trainer at PCCI an Alexandria-based firm. There, he was responsible for crisis emergency management, contingency plan review, and training. He has a BA degree in environmental management from UC Canberra in Australia, and is a member of the International Association of Emergency Managers. Our second speaker today is going to be the Honorable Susan, Le is it Leal? That's good. Leal. Very good. Susan is the Chief Strategy Officer and Senior Vice President for Water in the Americas at ACOM. She is a water utility expert and author specializing in identifying realistic and creative solutions to the water-related challenges facing our world. She was a Senior Fellow of the Advanced Leadership Initiative at Harvard University, uh, Stanford of the East, by the way, in 2009 to 2011. No, it's the Cal of the East. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a Stanford grad. I can't, I can't help it. I'm so sorry for you. Go ahead. <laughs> As part of her fellowship, she co-authored Running Out of Water, a book focused on solutions to our looming water crisis. She continues to serve in, as, as an associate of the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard. She's a member of the board of the, of the advisory board of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at UC Berkeley. Uh, OK. Where she, <laughs> sorry where she also received her undergraduate and law degrees. As manager of San Francisco's Public Utilities Commission, she led the charge for a dramatic upgrade of the Bay Area's seismically unsafe water system and San Francisco's outdated wastewater system. She previously served two terms as the elected treasurer of the city and county of San Francisco and as a member of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. And then our last speaker is Lindine Patton, who we heard from last panel. So I assume we read her bio then. Great, so I don't have to do it again. 
Thank you. So, so we're just going to go in order, uh, and then as I said, I'll end up. So why don't we start with Jonathan Reeves, who's going to talk about uh, wastewater, I'm sorry, water systems resiliency from an operational perspective. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for inviting me and uh, having me come and talk. I wasn't sure on the audience, but I do know I only have 10 minutes, so I'll be brief and to the point. But uh, DC Water, just for those of you that aren't in the region and don't use our products, is basically encompasses the District of Columbia. We do water distribution and we do sewer collection and treatment for a fair portion of the surrounding region. So um, we have one of the largest advanced wastewater treatment plants in the world. We do about 330 million gallons per day of treatment capacity here. So before I start on, I'd just like to quantify what I'm talking about. Um, when I was asked to come here and talk about water systems, I see water systems as not just potable water distribution and not just uh, water distribution pumping systems, but also the sewer collection, the sewer treatment, and then the discharge back into our, our waterways. So when I do talk about water and, and a water nexus, I'm in talking about all of those encompassed uh, activities. And I think it's important to sort of quantify that and understand that. So when I was asked to talk about the, the the sort of challenges as a water manager and how we're working towards being more resilient. I think the first note I put down is the community's expectation is one of our largest challenges. So when we're in the water industry and, and we're providing a service, we provide a service that's unconsidered or not thought about until it's disrupted and we're expected to provide that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And under the, the sort of association with climate change and severe weather and climate adaptation, that's really posing some challenges for the industry because it's getting increasingly difficult to provide and meet that community's expectation of that consistent, non-stop, uninterruptible supply where I turn the tap on, I wash my hands, the water's there, it meets a regulated standard and then I can flush it away and forget about it. So I think that's really our Community expectation is, is one of our core challenges as a manager and you only have to read through the newspaper of some of the events we've had here in the district over the past uh, two weeks, three weeks to see what level of uh, outrage and community anger we receive when we have sewer discharges and we have uh, our uh, collection products in places where they're not meant to be. So having said that, we are rising to the occasion, I believe, at DC Water, and we are trying desperately to be more resilient. I think we've passed the point of deciding whether climate change exists or whether severe weather is on the increase or whether it is a reality. Um, you only have to ask people that work at our organisation that have been there 30 or 40 years, and they will tell you that it is visually different than what it was when they first started working for the organisation. So, we are working towards those um, uh, meeting the challenges and meeting the expectations of the community, but I think the um, recently realised fact is that manifests itself as an increased burden on our customers. So we've seen unprecedented rate increases. Um, frankly, as coming from a country where it is incredibly dry, I believe that our water bills here in this country are practically free. But still, we have seen, you know, 10, 20, 30 percent increases in the rates we charge our customers, and most of that cost is going towards meeting our requirements to be a more resilient utility. So we're building large-scale um, tunnel projects to collect stormwater runoff, to collect the anticipated uh, increased discharge, to prevent um, sewer. CSOs, for those of you in the region that uh, don't know, yes, we do discharge sewer into the river when it rains. Um, it comes out of the system, it's designed to come out of the system, and we're trying to eliminate that. Now, that extra cost, though, ha is really um, starting to adversely impact our customers, and I, I wonder in the future how much more cost our uh, community will be able to bear. Now, some of the things we're doing with resilience, uh, we've talked about a lot here today, I've, I've heard a lot of people talk about you know, risk and vulnerability and, and understanding risk and vulnerability for your utility. You know, we use that as a planning tool and we use 
uh, AWWA's J100 standard. Um, there's some people in the room that'll tell you all about it. And it has helped us to, to understand what are our risks and more specifically, not to treat resilience as a, an all hazard approach. You know, I often hear people say, oh, well, we're, we have a more resilient community. You know, well, what does more, a more resilient community mean, you know, when it's compared to what are the threats that your community faces? So you could spend $100 million and build a flood wall, but if you never have a flood, then that flood wall isn't going to be very effective, as opposed to if you see a 10 or 15 degree average temperature increase in your community and you have people affected by the, that increased temperature, that increased heat. So we've now moved our paradigm shift for our planning, our long-term planning. Um, we use the 500-year flood level here in the district as our planning level. Um, unfortunately, most of our assets aren't movable. We don't have the opportunity to pack the largest wastewater treatment plant in the world up and move it somewhere else. So our approach at the moment is to create an island and essentially protect our asset. Having said that, part of that strategy is really understanding your cost and your benefit and really analysing that so that you can say, I'm about to invest this person's money to make our utility more resilient. Is this really where I should spend this dollar? So we do have assets within our system that are what I will call critical that we, we have not protected or we are not protecting and the cost benefit to actually meeting that just doesn't you, you just can't get the return on your investment for the protection so you know there are places that are exposed and there are places that if we do have a, a severe weather event then we are going to see you know a disruption to our 24 hour a day seven day a week service so I think that's really one of the key challenges and that really is where I see us as an organisation really where we need to step up to the plate. We really need to make sure we understand this and we are spending our customers' money in the right place. One of the things we have done um, at DC Water, which I think in some ways, except that she's on maternity leave, she would probably be here with us. We have an Office of Sustainability now and we have a manager of sustainability and we actually have a program where we are actively engaging the community and actively engaging our de operating departments in the utility to try and address some of these issues. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Susan? Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I know it's getting late in the day, so we hope to hold your attention a little bit longer. And I want to thank the the organizers of this event and for inviting me. It's uh, good to be back in D.C. where I spent many years after law school, so, so thank you for the invitation. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about how m making water utilities more resilient. And it was interesting to take this from the governance approach because it, it's really, um, it really goes to, to, to me, uh, it goes to the heart of the matter. And, I, and when we're talking about making water utilities water utilities more resilient. I'm going to focus a little bit more on the wastewater side, wastewater treatment, wastewater collection systems. You know, as we know, everyone takes that, you know, takes those systems for granted um, that we flush and it goes away, except when things go wrong and they get discharged in the wrong places, um, like bays or rivers where they're not supposed to be. Um, but let me, go over some of the some of the major steps that I think that where uh, some water utilities are taking some actions to make their utilities um, uh, more resilient their systems more resilient and I think the the major steps are commitment and that's probably and I'm going to spend a little bit more time on that in fact a good bit of focus on that because that goes a lot to governments governance and that's commitment meaning commitment by the leadership of that utility commitment by that local government that may run that utility, commitment, enough commitment they're going to ask the ratepayers to pay more money, which is often a very tough thing. The next thing is going to be actionable science. And I think uh, you've heard some people refer to that before as usable science. In other words, getting up-to-date science. What does the science tell us today? What do we need? What do we believe we need to protect against in the next 50 years, the next 100 years? 
and then doing that vulnerability and risk assessment, looking at those different assets. And if we're looking at wastewater systems, we're looking at pump stations and treatment plants. And that may sound mundane to some of us, but folks in, in New York City and New York City DEP, uh, their water and wastewater system, they can tell you after Sandy how much those, those systems were, how, what it meant for those to be knocked out for hours or days. So you look at that, the vulnerability, the risk assessment, which assets are vulnerable, what's going to be the operation uh, impact, and then what are your adaptation strategies? What are you going to have to do? What what's, are some of the design guidance you're going to have going forward? What are you going to have to do? What uh, capital improvements or changes are you going to have to make to those systems? When we're talking about commitment, I want to talk a little bit uh, about a utility that that I was involved with for several years. And the company I'm with right now, they're doing a, a, quite a bit of work for them in terms of scientific studies, engineering studies. And that's the San Francisco Public Utilities um, Commission, which is also known as the Hetch Hetchy Water System. It provides water to about 2.6 million people in the San Francisco Bay Area, San Francisco County, San Mateo County, Santa Clara County, and parts of Southern Alameda County and then wastewater services for a little over a million people, and then hydropower services for uh, customers in both the Central Valley and in uh, the city of San Francisco. So in terms of, of, of that, of that uh, utility, um, it's, it's had some up and down time. Um, when, uh, when I ran the utility uh, several years ago, uh, basically from 2000, 2004 through 2008 for about five years, we had just come out of a rate freeze, a nine-year rate freeze. Um, and, and that goes a little bit to the issue of commitment, especially that's what's ongoing right now. And so we'll move forward to we, the utility has made some commitments, but we're moving forward now into the last year or so. The utility has realized that it needs to spend about $2.7 billion to upgrade its wastewater treatment plants, and its collection system. As part of that, they realize that they also need to look at what are some of the things that they need to deal with in terms of climate change. How do they, as part of that overall upgrading of that system, how do they make that system more resilient? So that, that's the first part of saying, okay, we're going to commit $2.7 billion to upgrade that system. We're gonna, now going to even have to spend more money to look at how we're going to make that system more resilient to sea level rise and storm surge and king tides as, it, as you will get along the bay and, and the ocean. So they, they made that commitment. And that's probably the, the, one of the most important is to then, first you ask your rate payers, hey, I'm going to have to raise your rates to get $2.7 billion out of you. And oh, by the way, we're going to maybe even need some more to make it more resilient to climate change. And that's the real tough thing, because the federal government's not going to help you. It's not been since the Nixon administration that the federal government has provided money to local jurisdictions. So that's the tough thing, is that commitment. And I think the, the city leaders and the heads of the utilities have really stepped up to the ratepayers and, and engaged and educated the ratepayers so they're part of the process and they're buying into that system. So they've gone through and they've done their scientific studies and they've gotten the, some of the best science. You know, what is the science of today telling them about sea level rise and storm surge? They've started to do that vulnerability assessment and they've started to do that um, risk assessment, meaning which assets will be at the greatest risk, which assets will have the greatest impact on your operations. So they've started to go through that. And now they're next, coming back to the next step, which is looking at trying to implement, implement those adaptation strategies. So those are the, those are the main steps. And, they're, and it, it, the toughest one always is going to be that initial commitment and that ongoing commitment that you're going to have to raise people's rates. And I'm glad Jonathan mentioned rate payers, because we can talk a lot about you know, someone, someone may say that you have to have these regulations or that Zurich has to step up and do this and that. 
but it's going to take, when we talk about climate change, we need change agents. And that's hopefully a lot of people in this room and your colleagues. They're gonna reach out and your local utilities and get them to step up and make those commitments um, to make their utilities more resilient. So I can get into more of the steps of that and maybe I can get to that with some of the questions. But the main point I want you to come away with is that there are, are the scientists out there, there are the engineers out there, there are the different companies can implement, uh, whether it be public employees or there would be outside consulting engineers and construction that can provide us with that resiliency, whether it's our wastewater systems or our water systems. But the most, the toughest hurdle to get over is having leaders, whether it be on the local level, or the state level, or the regional level, or the tribal level, that are gonna actually be the change agents and engage their customers, educate them about their system, and let them know that they're gonna to have to pay more so that 24 seven, that system will run for them. So those are my comments for now. Thank you. Lindine. Thanks. Um, well, I have to say I would absolutely second what Susan just said. Um, leadership is essential. The good news is that uh, the water industry is largely characterized by a lot of very sophisticated leaders. Water managers are no uh, strangers to conflict. Um, I should note that I grew up in the West, I was educated in the West largely, and the West is the home of water wars for different reasons. When you're from the East, um, your concept about water is, I think, a little culturally different. Your, your exposure is different. Um, uh, I think when I talk to people about water in D.C., people think about flood. When I think about water, the first thing that comes to my mind is drought, <laughs> um, not enough water. So it's, it's all where you're from and where you were raised and where your experience is, but the reality is we have a tremendously sophisticated water delivery, freshwater delivery, and wastewater management system across the United States. It's largely engineered, and it's based on environmental, demographic, and economic conditions that I think, as someone noted in one of the early, earlier panels, are reflective of 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. <laughs> so the, the challenge that we have is that we're working with a series of systems um, that were engineered with great sophistication, with a tremendous safety margin. But we're doing so in the face of a loss of stationarity which really substantially changes the inputs to those systems and makes the inputs very different than those which were, ba that were the base of the design criteria. We also are trying to operate those systems in a circumstance where you have sea level rise, where perhaps a component of those systems was based on gravity. And the gravity works only when the water isn't higher than the outflow point, which creates a little problem. Um, tends to cause some challenges generally with a lot of sewage backup, uh, which is not what customers are expecting in any way. Um, but that's functionally, there's no surprise here, actually, in a lot of the engineering. The issue is, how do we deal with a system that's very expensive, that's structured, um, that, as, uh, as Jonathan was saying, you've, you've got to figure out how you are going to figure out where to invest. You know, do you take your pumps that were supposed to go this way and reverse the flow and make them go this way? Well, if you do that, then you have to have a whole other system to receive them at the end. Um, and that does take some leadership. It takes really significant economic analysis to marry up to your engineering solutions. So I think that the challenges that present themselves are, are, not, are not challenges, again, necessarily of pure engineering and science. It's mar marrying up that engineering and science with economics and leadership um, and trying to do it within a governance structure 
that assumes that we knew it all and that what we knew at the period of time when we wrote a statute that referred to a particular design or maintenance criteria was right. And that's pretty typical of our legal system. People don't want to make, have historically have not wanted to make regulations or statutes very broad in their character. They like them to be specific so it's clear about what the obligations are and the delivery endpoints are. The negative side of having that great clarity with, let's say, a particular design standard is if the science upon which that design standard was changed, then you may have a challenge in terms of being able to go through and change your design standards to reflect the changed conditions so that you can argue that you, can, you should, um, in order to make your system run correctly, change the way that you procure or change the way that you manage these systems. There are very, there are people who are sitting in this audience who I know have worked on um, very interesting and sophisticated risk management and vulnerability assessment tools that are state of the art and which, and which form the basis for um, standards that are being applied by water utilities across the nation. And so, you know, those of you who are in the audience, the scientists, have done terrific jobs in this area. This is a governance challenge. And I think that your inputs are, are going to need to continue to be present. But I think you need to understand the ecosystem into which you're providing your science. And that ecosystem is a legal system. And it's got a statutory component, and it's got a, um, a common law component to it. And I think that people need to take a hard look at that statutory component to enable leadership and leadership in these areas to make the changes that are going to respond to this loss of stationarity and sea level rise and other impacts that are associated with climate change. And I think that, again, as I had made comments related to other governance conditions in the past panel, insurance is a modality of the capital market. Um, it, it does impact, it, it does respond to impacts of extreme events and weather events in terms of uh, responding to asset damage. But it is not necessarily the modality that is used by municipalities um, or that, that operate wastewater treatment plants or water delivery systems. In fact, those may be governmental entities which self-insure or that participate in risk retention groups. So we may not be a driver of core significance in all municipal business. And that's important to understand how those groups are working, that it really is a core governance function. On the impact end, we may be in a position where there are certain losses that are paid for by a personal lines coverage, that are paid for by um, uh, a commercial lines coverage. Uh, but it does get a little murky in the context of water, because how our, our national risk management system, which is kind of both got public and private components, for example, with the National Flood Insurance Program, sometimes you have to ask where the water came from to figure out which risk management system response. And that makes it very difficult to figure out where the incentives lie and how to structure that governance system to be the most responsive uh, in the context of addressing water and wastewater management, especially where you have a tremendous urbanization and moving to coasts, where people literally are not only moving to the water, but they are creating environments in which they live where they concentrate the water and change the flow of that water and change the rapidity um, or the speed with which large volumes of water present themselves and get dumped into these engineering systems that maybe hadn't anticipated that much that fast <laughs> in that one spot. Um, so I think I'll stop there with my comments and I think it's much more important to get to Q&A for people. Hey. Thank you. I'm just going to fight, provide a couple of comments first around kind of the Department of Energy. I guess I feel compelled to say something about uh, the place I work. Um, so um, the department just last year put out a report on the vulnerabilities to the energy systems around climate change impacts. And I don't know how many folks are familiar with that report, but there was a pretty big chapter on water and the, some of the impacts and the nexus between water and energy systems. Uh, that we are, in fact, looking much more closely at now uh, and trying to understand kind of what those climate change impacts on the water systems are and what they mean for energy systems. Um, so there's this nexus, of course, between needing water to produce energy 
uh, coal-fired power plants, nuclear power plants, hydro markets, and, and I think California is unfortunately very familiar now with what lack of water means to uh, lack of electricity for them, uh, as well as the need for energy to move water around. So the ability to uh, build new pump stations and reverse water flows uh, and the type of energy technology that uh, is conducive to those engineered water systems. Um, let me just make a plug for something that we're doing called the Quadrennial Energy Review. Uh, and in it will be a component of the water energy nexus and focused first around conveyance of water uh, for energy purposes. And uh, so I encourage anybody who's interested in uh, water energy nexus and, and the implications of uh, drought and flooding and higher water temperatures, because you may even have a problem with operating a power plant if your water temperatures are too high. Um, and, and so uh, pay attention to what's going on with the Quadrennial Energy Review. Uh, we're in a, a stakeholder comment period now. We actually have a meeting June 19th in San Francisco around the water energy nexus. Um, so uh, pay attention at the Department of Energy's website um, on that. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the West, because Lindine brought it up. We have a saying out there that out West, water is for uh, fighting and whiskey is for drinking. Uh, and so, you know, it clearly represents uh, not just today's environment, but a, a habitual challenge that the West has uh, with water. And unlike here, where you can literally just dip a straw in the river and pull your drinking water out and apparently put your bad water back in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but I live in D.C. You know, we have a joke. Get out of the river. Um, so, <laughs> um, I would just like to say that we improve the water quality of the Potomac <laughs> River without discharge. <laughs> Still won't swim in it. Um, <laughs> But, but so unlike here in the east, as, as Lindine pointed out, out west, we have to move our water great distances. Um, and that unfortunately means both lots of energy and lots of water loss. Um, and so uh, one of the things that I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, in the context, especially out west, but even uh, to some extent um, uh, just up to the Mississippi River, uh, is the implication of tribal communities and the great amount of claim that they have to much of the water of the West and what that means for water resiliency issues, um, climate change mitigation issues, uh, and cooperative uh, jurisdictional efforts uh, in dealing with this water issue um, out West. Um, I'm not going to go too much into, I'm a water rights lawyer, that's what I started doing when I first started practicing law. Um, but suffice it to say, the tribes basically have claim, and f mostly first claim, to the water of this country. Uh, and through a series of federal law decisions starting in 1905, um, those claims have uh, pretty much been upheld uh, throughout the last hundred or so years uh, as tribes have tried to bring water to uh, their reservations. Various different legal doctrines control how much water tribes have, uh, what their priority in time is. Out west, we have a prior appropriation doctrine, which means first in time, first in right, the first to use the water gets to use the water. Um, but tribal claims uh, don't really fall under that. They have a, there's a doctrine called a Federal Reserve Rights Doctrine that allows tribes to lay claim to water e either aboriginally, i.e. from time immemorial, the Pueblos, for example, of New Mexico have water rights claims back to time immemorial. So they are first on the system versus, say, tribes who have reservations uh, and their claims uh, date to the date of the reservation. Uh, the amount of water that tribes are entitled to is really based on the purpose of the reservation. And there's, uh, again, a Supreme Court case law as well as United States Supreme Court case law as well as some critical state Supreme Court case law, Arizona, for example, which has attempted to quantify how much that water is. Um, so between the, the Federal Reserve water rights, Aboriginal water rights, and then this uh, quantification of water rights, um, tribes have litigated water rights claims all over the West. Um, the United States has a very firm position that they will attempt to settle as many of these water rights claims um, as possible. And for the last 30 years, uh, they have been successful at settling about 30 
uh, water rights claims from 30 tribes. But there are hundreds more tribes who are entitled to water um, who have not had their water rights claims either fully adjudicated um, or settled. Uh, and so there's kind of this outstanding claim against water out west uh, that I think is critical for water planners and, and folks who are dealing with especially water shortages um, to think about. Um, in Cal as an example of kind of what's left out there, none of the California tribes, with the exception of three, there are a hundred of them, three tribes have settled or adjudicated their water rights claims, so there's 90-something uh, more to go. There have been no settlements of water right claims in Oklahoma, the Midwest, or the Great Plains on either the Arkansas, the Red, the Missouri, or the Mississippi River, um, with the exception of the lower Colorado Basin, uh, which would include starting with Fort Mojave, which is at the N Nevada, Arizona, California border and south. None of the main stem claims to the Colorado River have been adjudicated. Navajo, the Navajo Nation, which is the largest tribe uh, in the country, both size, number, and size-wise, has over a billion acre feet of claims to the Colorado River and the San Juan River. Um, in Arizona, the tribes that still have claims to be adjudicated, their claims out, out are more than the Arizona water budget in total. <laughs> so, um, and, and they just settled some pretty massive claims out there where uh, Gila River, for example, now has, is entitled to about 30% of the Central Arizona Project water. So, um, so these water right claims are out there um, and they are slowly but surely making their way through settlement uh, processes, and as I said, the U.S. position has been to settle these claims. Um, in these 20, I think it's 28 settlements, in these 28 settlements across just the West, just the West, uh, 4 million acre feet of water have gone to tribes. So uh, it's a huge amount of water. Crow Nation, 650,000 acre feet, as some examples of how big these are. The Navajo portion of their San Juan River, 600,000 acre feet of water in Northwest New Mexico. Um, but the interesting thing about these claims now is that many of them incorporate a whole host of other settlement requirements and including water infrastructure development. And what we're seeing more and more of is part of the deal to settle the claim is the local communities who will be losing water when the tribes get the water um, strike a deal where they get some additional benefit from these claims, and that benefit tends to be water infrastructure. So as an example, with the Navajo uh, San Juan River settlement, uh, part of the deal was to build a $2 billion pipeline from the San Juan River to Gallup, New Mexico, so that the city of Gallup would be able to now get water from the San Juan River. Uh, in northern New Mexico, there are three or four pueblos that just settled outside of Santa Fe, and part of that settlement included a water delivery system uh, to provide water to the city and county of Santa Fe. So a lot of the local communities are also now benefiting, uh, as well as the tribal communities, where on-reservation water systems are now being built, water uh, on-reservation irrigation systems are now being built, um, but the local community is also getting some additional uh, benefit of that. Uh, the other thing that we're seeing in a lot of these water rights settlements is the ability for tribes to lease their water to local communities. So uh, as part of the Gila River settlement and other settlements in Arizona, uh, most of the Arizona tribes actually lease their water to the city of Phoenix, the city of Scottsdale, um, the city of Maricopa. Uh, and that's so that they get some benefit. They can't fully use all that water, so they lease it. So there is a, a, an exchange, if you will, of value occurring uh, in these settlements as well. Um, and, and many of them also have intergovernmental dispute resolutions built into these settlement agreements so that uh, you avoid litigating these, se these settlements uh, at the end, although uh, it's proving that you can't avoid litigation um, altogether. A note quickly about kind of the governance of Indian water. Um, water is a trust resource for the tribes. Uh, the United States has a trust responsibility to Indian country and a trust responsibility to its natural resources. Uh, and so it is a trust resource. So the trustee, the United States, is responsible for caring for um, and protecting tribes' water rights. 
They're also responsible for regulating, managing, and having authority over the use of water on reservation lands. So the governance of water in Indian country is really a federal government responsibility. The Department of the Interior, uh, Secretary of the Interior through the Bureau of Indian Affairs um, is responsible for operating and maintaining irrigation systems, water systems, and protecting those water rights. Are you okay? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't, I hope I didn't upset you. Give no tribes some around here. There's something in the water. <laughs> Well, it did storm yesterday. And we did have a little rain event. <laughs> um, so, and existing irrigation systems are generally owned and operated by the BIA. Uh, and so when we talk about governance and resiliency in Indian country, we're really talking about a federal responsibility there. Um, on reservation water, as we call it, both tribal water and non-tribal water, but and especially Federal Reserve water rights aren't subject to state law. They're not subject to state jurisdiction. They're not subject to state control. So in Arizona, as an example, where you have groundwater monitoring schemes to make sure that people aren't uh, uh, depleting the aquifers, um, or in any other state where you have regulations over the water, those regulations won't apply uh, in Indian country. Um, and then, as I said, lastly, uh, these was water rights settlements that have started adding irrigation systems and water systems also have started to add a requirement to the tribe to adopt their own water codes and their own water conservation measures. And all of that is part of a component to shift the responsibility for managing and regulating water from the Department of the Interior to the tribe itself. So in order for the tribe to take control of their water resources, uh, the department has required the tribes to adopt water codes that include a whole host of uh, regulatory uh, schemes, including due process rights, et cetera, for water users. Uh, but we're starting to now see a shift in these water settlements of interior control over water systems to tribal control um, over water systems. Let me just last um, make a note, kind of in the terms of uh, how the implications of kind of water rights settlements, water right claims, and certainly um, more infrastructure being built in Indian country uh, as these water rights uh, settlements are being finally implemented. Uh, implications for tribes to think about and for the folks who surround tribes to think about uh, and the implications for, the, for resiliency one, as we've heard earlier, you know, the federal government doesn't invest in water systems anymore. USDA does in rural America, and they do in Indian country. IHS, Indian Health Service, um, is the primary funder of water systems in Indian country. But that investment is very limited, and it's certainly not enough both to take care of the needs for clean water systems and the upkeep of clean water systems. Um, tribes, as I said earlier, have senior claims um, to the water, and as these settlements result in wet water actually finally flowing to Indian country, um, the systems that deliver the, that water needs to be resilient. It needs to be able to provide the water. So we're, we see things like the American Canal out in the Southern California desert uh, having to be lined um, so that more water will flow to the tribes who are entitled to the water um, from that canal system. Um, as more tribes put their water to use, there will be more demands on that water infrastructure, both on reservation and off reservation. The United States will be required to make sure water gets delivered to those tribes. So those folks who own water conveyance systems or are responsible for them, there will be a further demand on those systems to deliver um, that promised and negotiated for water. Um, and, and on top of all of this, the challenge that tribes have, unfortunately, in their water uh, settlement efforts is the water wars. Um, and they're still being fought. So there's a huge challenge around cross-jurisdictional cooperation, getting tribes to sit down with the very people who didn't want them to get water in the first place um, to try and deal with resiliency and the governance of these systems um, is going to be uh, an interesting challenge for tribes to deal with, again, especially out west. But we're starting to see more and more of this in the Midwest and the Great Plains as tribes are preparing water rights claims uh, on the Missouri and Mississippi River. So um, just some other things to think about as we think about governing systems. I know we don't have this problem out here. There aren't that many tribes. In fact, there are none out here. Um, but certainly out west and in the Midwest, 
uh, as we're thinking about water resiliency and water infrastructure, uh, the interaction and implication of, of tribal water rights and tribal water systems uh, is, is just another factor uh, to, to throw into the risk mitigation and uh, valuation uh, and all the other science and engineering and math stuff. I'm a lawyer, so I don't know anything about math, but um, <laughs> that's why I hire mathematicians. Um, but just another thing to, to think about. So um, just some thoughts to, to um, end the panel discussion. And um, without further ado, we will open it up for questions. So let me see first if there's, we've got a question over here. Okay. Thanks. Um, I wanted I to happened. ask if the panel could speak specifically about um, the difficulties in rolling out green stormwater infrastructure versus gray infrastructure. And just a little context. Um, so I worked in China for a couple of years for a British engineering firm. We partnered actually with EDAW, which is now part of AECOM, for um, a big project around Lake Wuxi, which had an algae outbreak, and in which we introduced riparian buffers, wetlands, and then actually my own role was to create the signage that actually allowed the users to understand how it worked. Long story short, it came back to the U.S., and I, I'm not aware of that. I, I know there's a lot of, the, the, increasing the discourse is, is, um, is identifying this issue. Um, in, you know, the, uh, Department of Energy, um, ED, uh, Army Corps of Engineers has websites dedicated to it, but just for example, I, one of my cousins just graduated for, with a civil engineering degree a couple of weeks ago and had never heard of the concept of, of green infrastructure. Um, so I'm wondering if you could I speak can... about how, I, and, and it's clearly an interjurisdictional issue, and the Philadelphia watershed is one of the best examples of trying to introduce um, a funding mechanism in which, for example, um, as I understand it, um, the developers and landowners will be taxed um, for the percentage of their plot that with non-porous surfaces and that is pooled together to allow for on-site treatment as well as increased riparian buffers and um, natural wetlands. And so how, how do we roll this out, um, please? Uh, there are a number of jurisdictions that are, that are putting in place uh, green infrastructure and the, the company uh, I work with, AECOM, is uh, working with a number of, of uh, cities uh, that are putting in place green infrastructure. San Francisco, which I mentioned, is, and, and part of their uh, adaptation strategy is uh, both not only gray infrastructure but green infrastructure. Um, Philadelphia, as you mentioned, uh, New York City, New York DEP is looking at a number of uh, green infrastructure strategies. And you've, you raised a lot of concepts. One of them is actually uh, a utility putting in green, green infrastructure as a way of uh, slowing down uh, storm water in the, as you know, that you know the hundred-year storm is no longer the hundred-year storm. It's maybe the hundred-year storm maybe comes like four or five times a year or more, and so um, it, it's slowing down that that uh, water coming into the system, especially a combined system. So that an amount of water, as Jonathan knows, that that big storm will come in, the treatment plant won't be able to handle it. Boom, and there you have a uh, overflow into your bays or waters or, or, or other rivers and the like. So you're looking at green infrastructure as one of those tools to help slow down that water. Um, and you mentioned Philadelphia, uh, NYC, DEP, San Francisco PUC is doing that. Los Angeles, uh, LA City, San is doing a lot of that. And then the other concept you talk about was where, where stormwater fees are being used, like say where uh, business owners or, or uh, uh, other landowners have uh, even public landowners have large impervious pavement where they are being charged stormwater fees because that, that means that there's a lot of water that's gonna run off those, the, you know, those sidewalks, those big asphalt parking lots and hit, hit the uh, stormwater systems. So those are two concepts, but they're, they're, they're being uh, implemented in a number of cities. One of the things I just wanna mention very briefly is as part of the, the, the communication and customer engagement they, that they used at San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, and they used a little bit in New York, is actually sitting down with their customers, showing them a problem of, of certain areas where there was flooding or, or the system being hit very hard with stormwater, and showing the different methods how you could slow that water down, both with green infrastructure and uh, green infrastructure, uh, the combination and having people understand how the two, how you could use those two concepts to actually uh, 
um, uh, Im improve your system, I the system's operation. Yeah, that, that's something like that. yeah, I just want to make a, a comment. I think um, the challenge in scaling these solutions is financing in many cases. Some of the, of the project references that were indicated, for example, Philadelphia and others, have come out of settlement negotiations. Uh -huh. And they, as a consequence, because they are associated with a legal action and it's a compelled activity, they are able to easily achieve municipal bond type financing or bond rate type mm -hmm. financing. Um, unfortunately, at this point, because the green infrastructure has got some other kinds of challenges in, to date, although there are some people trying to fix this, it's become a challenge to get the financing, the same kind of financing for green infrastructure that you get for gray. Why? Um, the gray infrastructure is engineered, it's man-made, it's controlled, it has specific tolerances, degradation terms, um, components, and it doesn't require, um, it requires some maintenance, but not a lot of love and attention. And the other, in, in, in particularly it is, um, it's stuff, it's pieces, right? It doesn't grow, it doesn't die, it doesn't require watering, it doesn't involve um, more man hours in most cases. The man hours are specified in, in the gray infrastructure. So there, when you have a capital system which is um, geared towards optimizing costs to reduce variables associated with long-term O&M, um, you're, you need to really think about how, what great green infrastructure is asking you to do. It's asking you to have more maintenance issues. And that has been a bit of a tension in the finance side. We, um, it's not insurmountable in any way, but it would be nice to not have to go to litigation to get the same um, confidence on the financial market side that without the litigation compelling the action that the utilities would go forward and maintain that green infrastructure to well, the same it, height. It, in the case so of, in it's the an case, interesting issue. In the case of LA, in the case of San Francisco, that's where the city leaders decided to go ahead with green infrastructure. And I have to say, I'm going to challenge you a little bit on that, it can be engineered to a point where even gray infrastructure has to be maintained, and yep. it can be uh, um, engineered to a point where it can be not ha doesn't have the same level of effectiveness. In other words, a pipe's going to move a lot of water somewhere, and maybe green infrastructure may slow some water down. But they can be engineered now, and I, in fact, the engineers I work with have come up with pretty um, pretty well designed green infrastructure systems that can, and it doesn't necessarily mean plants all the time. Sometimes it usually does involve plants, but it could be grand, uh, gravel or sand or other things to slow the water down as well. Over here. Uh, thank you. This uh, question is for you, Pilar, and it's really more of a, I don't know, maybe it's too much of a statement. Maybe I'll ask a question at the end to make it all right. But um, you've, you've, you've talked about Indian water and Indian water settlements. And since our larger discussion here has been about climate and water and governance, I, I just want to say that, as I'm sure you know, the world of Indian water and climate in the West is a bit messier than it, it sounded in your description. I've been uh, a member of the Circle of Advisors to Black Mesa Trust, which is the 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 Hopi tribe's elders for many years now. And only in the last few weeks, this administration, like every administration since the Kennedy administration, has once again used uh, the dispute over the Hopi tribe's water rights and more recently, uh, flagrant violation on the part of the federal government of its own federal strip mine laws to assure that Peabody Coal Company controls the water and the coal for the Hopi people and continues to degrade their land, their water, their culture. Uh, it's not DOE's fault. This is all an interior problem. But it's, it's a national shame, and it's gone on for years. And I think that there is a, um, a history of, of cultural values, and I know you know this, of cultural values and conflicts regarding Indian tribes in the West and, and water issues, and more recently climate, uh, that deserves more recognition than it gets. Thanks. Yeah, um, so I heard a question mark at the end. Right, yes, thank, thank you. 
Um, yeah, you know, they have four days symposiums on just water issues today. I will say that, you know, there's a saying um, by um, an old solicitor's office attorney, Felix Cohen, who wrote the handbook on Indian law, that uh, tribes are like the canary in the coal mine um, from a legal perspective. And we're starting to say that from a climate change perspective, because they suffer the most from climate change impacts, especially in Alaska. Um, but it seems to me that uh, in the northwest of Arizona, where we have huge water energy needs, and the coal mine feeds a coal-fired power plant or two, um, both of which need a lot of water, and uh, the water needs for that energy plant. That's a, the, the Navajo Generating Station is a 2,200-megawatt two, coal-fired power plant on the Navajo land um, using coal from uh, the Kayanta mine, and both those activities use a lot of water, and they're using Navajo and Hopi water to do it. Um, and it, it seems that it can be the harbinger of the challenge that the country as a whole is going to have, and that is um, how do we deal with a water, a decreasing water or water we can't use anymore for what we typically use it for um, when we need it for so many things. And so the conflict in water use, uh, which we see acutely on the Navajo Reservation, um, uh, could be kind of the canary in the coal mine for the conflict of water use, especially out west. When do I use it for a coal-fired power plant, or do I use it to drink? Because that's the question on Navajo. Yeah, the real conflict is, who is this we talking? Well, <laughs> since the 2,200 megawatts of power goes straight off the reservation, it's not Navajo who benefits from that coal-fired power plant, other than lease payments. I'm sorry. So we'll go over here. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Ramin Skeba. I'm a uh, scientist, actually a physicist, at uh, UC San Diego. Um, so I'm living in, in California, I used to live in Arizona, and I grew up in Colorado. As a couple of you mentioned, everyone out west is talking drought, drought, drought. And so what I'm wondering is what are, what are your views about where uh, efforts could be focused most or first uh, to prepare for the next drought and the drought after that? Where do you think the, be the most gains can be made, say, in moving water over long distances, or maybe the water that's used for agriculture and irrigation, or by power plants, industrial consumers, residential consumers. I mean, I hear different numbers when people talk about um, how much water is consumed where, and you know, how much water is being wasted in which sectors. So I was wondering what your views are in, for dealing with, with the drought situations. I think, it, I think for urban customers, I think what we're looking at more is, is a lot of increasing the amount of water recycling. Um, Orange County, which is not known out west or as the most progressive place, but it, they, are, they, they led the state in, in their water recycling. In fact, I, my, the estimates are they will get a, close to a third of their potable water uh, from recycled water. So it's going out of their wastewater plant, treated, then putting into a, a groundwater basin, and then being used for potable water. So it's going to be more, re more water recycling. I think ag is, is, a, is a big area where we can still, you know, uh, uh, the estimates are about 50% um, of our uh, winter vegetables of the U.S. come from the Imperial Valley. Um, and that's the biggest user of the Colorado River. And they're, they're, they, my understanding, there are some improvements are underway, but there can be a lot more. So that's also, a, a, you know, the water footprint of the food we eat, especially in the U.S., is, is pretty... Uh, is pretty outrageous, and, and, and you know, five or six years ago when someone talked to me about Meatless Mondays as a way to, to improve our, 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 water, uh, our water footprint in the U.S., I, you know, I you know, rolled my eyes at them and scoffed at them as a hippie, you know, because we were both, this person saying that was raised in the 60s, and I said, oh, that's really crazy, but when you think of how much uh, water we use in, in making eight ounces of beef at, uh, it's, it's a lot of water. It, that, that could be the next big area is, is ag and, and actually the food we eat in the U.S. Okay. Uh, well, first I wanted to give D.C. a shout out for all their green infrastructure work, too. They weren't listed as one of the leaders, but they are. Um, and then I had a question on the drought side and the water recycling um, issue. One of the issues that we're encountering is in-stream flow needs and the needs of species as being sort of the downside for recycling strategies because you're not depositing that water back into the system. And I was wondering if, if Pilar or Susan or 
anybody could speak to that particular issue? Well, the water recycling, it, it actually, for, for those coastal um, areas I was talking about, for example, in Orange County and others, it actually is, an, is a benefit for the environmental benefit, that water recycling. In fact, the, the, the lawsuits that were levied against uh, or potential lawsuits against some of those counties for um, uh, the, the, the ecology of the beaches and the like, they were very supportive of the recycled water. So um, I think for at least in, in the West, uh, recycled water um, is still going to be overall a positive thing. But in, it, the, the problem with the West is that, in, in, especially in California, uh, you have 75 percent of your population in the southern half of the state, and the water's in 75 percent of the water is in the northern half of the state. So it's something we've got. And that's, you know, the unique thing about water out west or well, everywhere is that it's a state, you know, state level controlled. So, you know, even though many, much water rights are driven by federal decisions and, you know, multi-state um, adjudications, Arizona versus California, and you've got treaties with, with Mexico to deliver a certain amount of water through the Rio Grande and the Colorado River. Uh, and then you have claims on the river through, we call it fish water out there. So you gotta make sure there's enough water in the, the river for fish and people have to put water back in and they can't take too much out. And so these, all these regimes have, have lent themselves to kind of this crazy governance quilt of water and how it, before it even gets to the user, it's going through federal water and fish water and Indian water and you know, whoever else's water and everyone's got a label on it. And everyone, there's a different regime for each of those water systems. So, um, so it, it's, a, it's a huge, it seems to me, governance challenge and a multi-jurisdictional governance challenge because like oil, water likes to flow. And so kind of the question of whose water was it in the first place um, uh, becomes even more of a, an important question since we move water all over the place. I'm Justin Lawrence. I'm a AAAS fellow at the National Science Foundation. Um, big data is a buzzword we're hearing a lot around DC. And I've heard whispers <coughs> that uh, water utilities are considering distributed sensor networks to gather a lot more information on the movement of water throughout the entire uh, water infrastructure network. And I was curious um, if any of you have heard any uh, conversations entering in among decision makers uh, about this, this type of information. I know that um, uh, there are some utilities that are looking at some of their, there's, data, there's a lot of different ways that, that big data can, uh, can play a role. One of them, for example, is um, some watersheds are looking at putting sensors in, uh, where, especially where the, the snowpack has, has been greatly depleted, just to try to pick up where the water is and how, how quickly it's melting and how soon. Most of the storage uh, for water in the West, incidentally, 60% of the storage is normally in the snow but when you have very reduced snowpack, so you're looking at data there. And then within urban water utilities, um, there is um, uh, more work going on with uh, actually, and uh, allowing, again, back to that, that customer engagement, let, uh, bringing in the rate payer into the discussion. Um, uh, New York City um, and uh, I know San Francisco and others are letting people to actually monitor uh, their water use on a, a, and basically an hourly basis. Yeah, and from a, a specific utility, so here in DC Water we use a, an AMR system, Automatic Media Reader System, and the data collected from that will, can actually provide customers real-time data on problems with their system. So we can actually send you a text message to say, hey, you've got a broken pipe in your house because the, your trending water usage is, is increased out of a parameter that we've established. So utilities are using it a lot more for that and a lot more for leak detection and uh, corrosion detection. So. And, then, and then the other way they're using it is also is that they'll, they'll you say you're, you're in a this size house and you have four other people in it, this is how much water you should be using, or this is the average of how much people could, are using. So you're getting compared. So it's, yeah, I mean, you could look that up for. Great, any other questions over here? I have one short one. Um, I'm Sarah Green. I'm currently at the State Department for the year, but normally I live on the shore of Lake Superior. And so when this gentleman said, moving water of long distances, my antenna went up because everybody that I interact with near Lake Superior, as soon as they hear about droughts in the southwest, they think, oh, somebody's going to put a pipe in Lake Superior and suck all our water away. 
which, which is allowed. Um, not allowed by treaty, actually, with Canada. Um, <laughs> but I, I am curious about the, the notions of moving water long distances. And barring that, um, as droughts accentuate, or if they do as predicted, the movement, rather, of water um, of people to places where there is more water. Are people anticipating that as a resilience response? Well, I would say that there are development limitations, and you might be able to speak to this also. Um, I know in California there are development limitations which now require under certain circumstances that the developer prove that they have adequate water resources without impacting neighboring water resources. Um, when those rules went into place, they were quite controversial, but necessary. and. Um, I'm not sure if those are duplicated in other regions, but they're quite clear there. Uh, you gotta own it, you gotta have it, and it can't be someone else's, and you can't take someone else's, because they know there is a limited resource. And I suppose just, just quickly on that same point, and I, you know, I'll talk here for the East Coast and specifically to DC, in, in the region we're actually seeing a reduction in water consumption. It's about 3% per year, year over year, for the last 15 years. So, you know, and especially in the district, we used probably 20 million gallons a day more in the 50s than we do now. So, and that's in actual numbers. So, it, you know, the amount we're saving is, is quite considerable. So. That's about probably double in the West. Um, for example, in San Francisco, a customer is using about 55 gallons per day per person, which is about half of the statewide average. We use 160 gallons per day per person in Scottsdale, Arizona. There's a lot of golf courses. All right, Bob Faithful, this is tied to the uh, climate change and the temperatures changing, and more specifically for Mr. Reeves on invasive species. In terms of strategic planning and uh, looking ahead at uh, what type of things you will have to deal with, we all know about, at least in this area, about the snakehead fish, as well. but I'm talking more about the algae, plants, other things that perhaps haven't been in this area before. I was in Huts at the Hudson River uh, within the last two weeks, and they have a new plant that's taking over part of the area. Are there some plants, or do your planning uh, take a look at what may be coming from the tropics or other areas this way as the temperatures change? That's a wonderful question. I'm glad you asked it. Um, <laughs> I think a short answer to your question is no, but we do have a regional Potomac uh, River Basin Commission that does look at those sorts of emerging issues per se. Um, you know, one of the advantages we have here, our forefathers that built our water system actually t made it an aqueduct to, to prevent the, the, the need to use pumps to get the water out of the river. And in some ways that's also a hindrance because it makes it very difficult to keep invasive species out of the, out of the system. So. It's, a, it's, it's not something specifically that I've been involved in, in looking at, but I know the Commission has looked at, you know, sort of those sorts of issues. So we only have a few more minutes. We'll take one last question and then any other final comments from uh, the panelists, so. Well, this is certainly a question for the panelists, but it's perhaps an anthropological question. As a resident of, uh, of the area, I know that the water being pumped out of the Blue Plains plant when it's operating at capacity, is better quality than the water that people are pulling out of their faucets. Now, the anthropological question is, particularly when draws on aquifers in the coastal plain from Long Island all the way into, uh, all the way through South Carolina and into Georgia, are, <clears throat> are drawing down non, uh, non-renewable resources, namely confined aquifers, what prospect is there for encouraging more consumptive reuse of treated water instead of further draws on non-renewable water sources? It's certainly a coastal plain problem. I suspect it's a problem in other parts of the country as well. Thank you. Well, I suppose I failed to identify well, myself. I was, I was I'm Tel Dave, and I'm with the, the Episcopal Diocese of Virginia. 
But I think this is exactly what Susan was referencing in, in Riverside, particularly in Orange County, mm -hmm. um, where there is a, there are, I mean, there's certainly the technology to allow the use, treatment, reinjection, so which involves a kind of secondary treatment, which does restore it. Uh, it's an issue of, of leadership will. I mean, it's either that or you ro roll it back into the Potomac. Um, so I'll, I'll defer, I, but I, she, I think we already see, talked about You're going to yeah. see that more in the West where, there's, where there, the source of the surface water is much more dire. So just to, it, just to talk locally, um, the, it's been shown that there is no appetite for consumption of grey water in the region. And I'd ask everybody in the room who'd drink recycled water if they had an option not to. So we've got a few people. Versus no water? Versus. <laughs> now, if your opportunity is this is your only option, then that's, and that's what manifested itself in Australia. You know, we drink recycled water in Australia because the option was moved to another city. So it sort of drove that West Coast style conversation. But from a DC centric point, we are looking at um, revenue generation from our discharge. Um, so we are looking at places where we can sell that water to relative local places that, would, that, that could consume it, not necessarily for potable water consumption, but for other quasi-industrial process. I, I think it, it's an issue of educating people to understand that for most of us, our water's been used by millions of people before it ever gets to us. <laughs> and often, with the exception of a few water utilities, your water's been used by many, many people before it comes out of your tap. <laughs> Okay, so let me see if there are any final comments from um, each of the panelists before we, before we say goodbye for the day. Thank you. Thank you to the organizers. It's fun to be here, and I heard, learned a lot of great stuff today. Thank you. I'm, I'm fine. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. Hopefully it was enjoyable and a little dot, the, the uh, digs into Harvard notwithstanding. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. And we've got uh, the last panel coming up. Thank you. <laughs>